So we're thinking about being revived. We're thinking about being revived as a church. Revived means to come a lot. And of course, as I've been saying each and every week, that the church to be revived, you and I as individual followers of Jesus, need to be revived as well. But we, before we kind of look at the last of seven marks of a church that's being revived, I want to ask the question, why? Why? Why should we be revived? Why should we, we be revived as a church? And why should you be revived and experience new life as a follower of Jesus? It's a critical, critical question. Uh, I have three thoughts. Number one, God has called us. Remember back in Genesis, we, we thought about Genesis 2 2, where God says to the church, the people of God, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. God blessed them, not just for them, with the so that. I'm blessing you so that you will be a blessing. From the very beginning, the church was to bless other people. Remember the words of Jesus. We looked at this too, and he said, And I will build my church, and I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, I'm building my church, but I'm going to build my church through you. And I'm going to give you the authority. I'm going to give you the keys to the car. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And then, of course, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. He said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. God has called us. Remember the Apostle Paul words. He wrote this. And God has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We're Christ's ambassadors. And then Peter's words. Peter says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, so that, see, it's that goes back to Genesis, blessed to be a blessing, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Why? Why do we want to be revived? Why do you and I want to live at a different level of being alive more and more? Because one, God has called us. What an opportunity. What a privilege. Secondly, I think we have what people are looking for. We have what people want. Number one, church people. Church people. There are lots of people out there who used to go to church, who are looking for a church, and uh, I think we are becoming a church that people want to be a part of. We are or becoming a loving, justice-seeking, open and affirming, Jesus-centered, scripture-teaching church. These are my words at this point. Um, we take the gospel seriously and the call to make a difference, but we have fun. We celebrate God's goodness in each other, with each other. We're friendly, but we also want to make lifelong friends. We believe that God is good, that nobody's perfect, everyone's welcome, and you can make a difference. And I think that's the kind of church that church people are looking for. But I also think we're a church and becoming a church that unchurched people are looking for, whether they know it or not. These are people that might say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, right? Unchurched people are looking for a place like the one I described. They're looking for a community that is loving, that is justice-seeking, that is open and affirming, that is Jesus-centered. They want a place um, where they can, uh, that is serious about making a difference. They want a place uh, where a community laughs, that doesn't take itself so seriously, that we can make mistakes, that nobody's perfect. They're looking for a place where we believe that God is good, nobody's perfect, everyone is welcome, and we can make a difference, right? I think so. I think so. Jesus said this, I have come that you may have life. And people are looking for life. In fact, I think people, church people and unchurched people, are really pursuing the kingdom of God. They just don't know it's the kingdom of God. Paul writes these words about the kingdom of God. He says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, in that context, what Paul's saying is that the kingdom of God is not about rules and regulations. It's not about do this and don't do that, do this and don't do that. Now, we have do this and don't do that. But 
Paul says that's not primarily what the kingdom of God is about. The kingdom of God is about righteousness, right relationships. People are looking for right relationships. People are looking for a place to connect and be connected, to know and be known. Paul says the kingdom of God is not, not about rules and regulations, but about right relationships, peace, and joy. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Why do we want to be revived? Why do I want us to be revived? Why do you want us to be revived? Because we've been called. And I think we are a place that people want. And the third reason is for us. It's for us, for our faith, for our kids, for our grandkids. I, I want a church where, where Tiffany can grow up. My daughter, our daughter, could grow up and know Jesus and know God and take faith seriously, but have fun and laugh. I want you to be friendly to Tiffany, but I want her to make friends. Not just with my daughter, but your daughter and your grandkids and your kids and your friends and your family members and your neighbors that aren't here. I want us to be revived for, for us. For us. That's why. So we're thinking about the seven marks of, of a revived church. Uh, last time to review, I know you'll miss this. Number one was long, long life. You will miss this, right? It's lifelong discipleship formation. What's that mean? It means growing. It means growing. Uh, for us to be revived, we need to be growing and maturing in our faith. And the sign of growing is, are we more loving? It's not just more knowledgeable. But if, if, if learning doesn't translate itself into living, you're really not growing. The second mark was authentic evangelism. And the way I would describe that, that means going. Uh, just learning that, that you and I, as followers of Jesus, we are witnesses. And we are to be more effective. And the question is, am I, am I, am I an effective witness? Uh, the third mark was outward incarnational focus, which is really about grace. We've experienced grace and we extend grace to others. Are we, are we more of a, a, a hub that, that really thinks of others' interests before our own, or are we a little club? Um, so the question you want to ask is, do I consistently think of the interests of others? Then we thought about the fourth and power servant leadership, which is about gifts. We all have gifts. We all have a place to fit in to use our gifts, to, to discover them, to develop them, to deploy them for the benefit of others and for your benefit and my, my benefit. Uh, next, we talked about spirit-inspired worship, which is about our gathering. Uh, and the question is, do I worship in spirit and in truth? Uh, last week, we thought about caring relationship, which is really about group. You know, do we have a place? Will we have a place? Do you have people that you can meet with that you can be vulnerable with, that you can learn to take off your masks with? We can't do it with everybody. You don't want to do it with everybody. But we have to do it with somebody. Someone needs to know our deepest, darkest secrets, our sin, our brokenness, and our joys and our celebrations. And so that's about, about group. And the question is, do I have anyone that, with whom I can be real? And this morning, I want us to think about the exciting topic of ecclesial health. <laughs> What's that mean? Well, it's really about the governance of the church. Uh, the the uh, vital congregation office in the Presbyterian Church is kind of guiding us. And this is what they say ecclesial health means. It means this. There are several factors to ecclesial health. Prayerful discernment, decision-making process, health of pastors, stewardship of budget and resources, clarity in mission. That's what I want us to think about. Primarily, we're applying this to the church, but it also applies to you individually as a person. It applies to you individually as a person. <coughs> Clarity of mission. And that really has to do with three, uh, three things. Vision, values, and strategy. And again, we're going to think about it in terms of the church, but it really applies to you individually as a person. Now, do, do, you, do you have a vision for your life? Do you have values? If you do. Are they, do you, do you know what they are? And do you have a strategy for that vision, if you have a vision? So our text today is Ezekiel 37. Let me give you a little background on Ezekiel. Ezekiel's in the Old Testament, before Jesus. Ezekiel was a prophet. Prophets are truth tellers. I would not want to get a call to be a prophet. Because prophets, primarily their message is, 
You've sinned. You're sinning. God is holy and just, and there will be consequences for your sin. I don't want to sign up for the prophet role. Although there is a prophetic part of being a pastor. Uh, prophets were warning. Ezekiel lived about 600 years before the birth of Jesus. And Ezekiel, along with prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah, warned the people of Israel, God's people, that if they didn't uh, stop sinning, they didn't stop their injustice, if they didn't stop chasing after other gods, that there would be God's judgment. And so judgment came in two waves, about 200 years apart, in the form of the Assyrian army from the north coming down and capturing them and taking them back, and in later years, the Babylonian army. Ezekiel was living in Jerusalem when it was overtaken by the Babylonians, and he was exiled back up to uh, Babylonia. The map here, if you can see the one blue circle is Jerusalem, the Babylonian Empire came down, overtook Jerusalem, and took 10,000 Jews to Babylonia as, as slaves. So Ezekiel is a street preacher in Babylonia. He's not in his own context. He's a street preacher, and his message is this. He wants them to understand why this happened. He's basically saying, God has judged us like the prophets told you about because of your sin. He also wants them to understand that this is not a short exile. Many of them have believed that this would be a one or two year hand slapping and we're good, we're good, we're good, let's go home. Uh, most of the people would die in, in foreign occupation. And the last thing he wanted to know, them to know, not only was God judging them, not only would this last a whole lifetime, but there was hope. Prophets always had hope. So that's the context for our passage. And in, in Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel is going to get a message of hope for God's people. Here's what it says. Ezekiel writes, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out, of, out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. He's going to get a vision. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. So the question is, can these bones live? Can these bones live? It's a great question. See, the faith of God's people had been dead. The temple had been destroyed. Destroyed. They hadn't worshipped for a long, long time, and even without gathered public worship, their spiritual practices had fallen by the way, wayside. They were slaves in a foreign land, and then Isaiah gets a vision, and it's a vision of a valley of bones, very dry bones, which means these bones had been dead a long time. There was no flesh and blood, and the bones were just not uh, new. They had been parched by the sun, bleached by the sun. Very dry bones. Dead, 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 <laughs> is what Isaiah is trying to say in this, this imagery. And uh, there was no hope. There was no hope. In fact, later in chapter 37, the people say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. So the question is, can these bones live? Is there any hope? Can these dry bones come alive? And in the end of this vision, the answer comes back, yes, yes. Ezekiel continues, then the Spirit of God said to me, prophesy, which means speak. Prophesy to these bones, next slide, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come alive. 
I will detach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put my breath in you and you will come alive. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So there was hope. There was a vision of hope. And it didn't come from them. It came from the grace of God. What was the catalyst for this hope? It was vision. The catalyst for this hope was vision. Ezekiel got a vision from God, and he communicated it to the people of God, and this vision came true in time. But it was vision that started the catalyst of hope. And this is where clarity of mission begins. Clarity of mission for churches, for businesses, for uh, schools, for families, and for you and me has at least three components. Vision, strategy, uh, values, and strategy. Vision answers the question, why? And the question is, why do we exist as a church? The question for you is, why do you exist as a human being? Why am I going to be given 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 more years, et cetera, et cetera, to live? Why? It's a question not for churches, not just for churches, not just for businesses, but for you and me. Why am I here? What is my purpose? Why do I exist? How has to do with how we do what we do. I'll explain this later. How has to do with our attitudes and beliefs? How has to do with how we make decisions and how we live? Strategy answers the question of what. What are we to do to fulfill our why? So in the remaining time, I want to clear this up a little bit more. And I want us to think about vision and values. Here's what vision is. I think vision is a clear and compelling, clear and compelling, clear and compelling picture of the future that produces active hope in the present. I came up with that, which is very rare. <laughs> I do lots of research. You know, if you, if you just do one or two sources, that's plagiarism. But if you have eight or more sources, that's research. <laughs> Vision is clear. I hope that's not the main thing you get out of the sermon. <laughs> Vision is a clear and compelling picture of the future. Clear and compelling. Causes your heart to beat. That produces active hope in the present. Vision answers the question, why, as I said. Why, why is so important? Why is vision so important? Why is vision so important? Because it, it produces focus and it produces fuel, focus. Vision produces focus. Why are we here? Why are we here? Vision helps us know, ask the question, are we doing the right things? Are we doing the right things? See, vision in your family helps you um, ask, are we doing the right things? Are we doing the right things? We want to have a healthy marriage. We want to have healthy kids. We want to have kids that grow up to know Jesus. Are we doing the right things? My vision is so important. Are we doing the right things? Think about the disciples. Uh, they, had, they had a concrete vision from Jesus. Jesus said this to them. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Four things they were to do. Go to all nations, make disciples, baptize, and teach. That was their vision. That was their why. Listen to this. This is, this is, this is the kicker. Why help them determine what? Knowing their why help them to determine what? What should we do? Well, we should go. Where should we go? Go to all nations. And when we go to all nations, what should we do? Baptize and teach them to obey. That's it. Should we build schools? No. Should we fight racism? No. Should we build churches? No. Should we fight against Rome? No. Should we fight against slavery? No. Those are for other generations to do. See, those were good things to do. If you're a follower of Jesus, Somebody's got to do that, but for them, they knew their why. And so it helped them determine good from the best. It helped them to determine what to do. What are we to do? Go, make disciples, teach, and baptize. Difficult decisions are made easier when we know our why. Because
with Jesus. Jesus knew his why. It could be summed up in one of the statements in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus said, I have come that you, no, he said, I have come to seek and save the lost. That's his why. Jesus, why have you come? I have come to seek, go after, and save, bring into a relationship with me, those who are lost. So Jesus starts his formal teaching ministry. And he's teaching in northern Israel on the Sea of Galilee. He comes to a town of Capernaum. And uh, he's starting to become popular. He's breaking attendance records. He's teaching as one who has authority. And he's healing people. And one day in the town of Capernaum, he heals lots of people, but it's late in the evening, and he doesn't heal everybody. But he kind of shuts down his shop. He goes to bed, and the text said early in the morning, he gets up, and uh, he goes to pray by himself, and then Peter comes looking for him, and, and the text says in uh, Mark, everyone is looking for you. Why is everybody looking for Jesus? Because they didn't get healed the night before. Right? If, if, I, was, if I was in line and, and, and they stopped the line, sorry, we're, he's all out of healing for the night. Right? I'm sure I'm getting up at five in the morning and I'm looking for Jesus. And, and Peter says, everyone is looking for you, Jesus. Watch how Jesus responds. Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages. Ouch. That's insensitive. Oh, wait, 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 wait. You, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't heal my wife's foot. You didn't heal my kid. You didn't, you didn't. I want more teaching. No, I gotta go. It seems so cold and insensitive. He could easily be criticized. And watch what he says next. So I can preach there also. That is why I've come. See, he knew his, he knew his why. And it helped him make hard decisions. And it's actually not that hard when you know your why, what to do. But when you don't have a why, what to do is very, very confusing. Make sense? Make sense? Yeah. Still there? Yeah. Chip the ice off your ears? <laughs> Knowing your why helps you know what to do. Let me give you an example. When I first came to Davis, um, the church that I came to pastor was 30 years old. Six of the eight original founding couples were still in the church. They literally helped build the sanctuary and they literally made all the stained glass windows in their garage, all 12 of them. They planted redwood trees that were this high and 30 years later, you know how big redwood trees get. Well, I hadn't been there too long, about, um, about a year and a half to two years, and we, uh, after much conversation and prayer and doing a study of the facilities, we realized we had to move. The two and a half acres wasn't big enough, and so we had to move, move. That was the last thing that I wanted to do, was come and move a church, and no, I am not thinking about that here right now. This is an illustration just in case you were wondering. Well, long story short, we did move. The vote was 99%. All of the original families moved. Why, because they wanted to move? No, they did not want to move. But they knew their why, and their why of the church existed was to reach the un unchurched, is to reach those that haven't been reached with the good news. And since we all agreed on the why, when it came to the what, it made the decision easier. Make sense? Knowing your why. Vision is about why. Why are we here? Why do we exist? Strategy is about what, what we do. Why is about doing the right things. What is about doing things right? And see, if you don't have a clear why, and all you do is what, you might be doing things right, but if it's not doing the right things, what does it matter? You could be setting the tables correctly and putting the right chairs in, but if it's on a sinking boat, <laughs> you're doing things right, but you're not doing the right things. And so many businesses and schools and churches and families might be doing uh, things right, but they're not doing the right things. That's why vision is so, so, so important. 
Vision keeps you focused, but vision also keeps you fueled. Vision fuels hope and action in the present. Uh, when I graduated from uh, college, I took a job selling books door to door, uh, 80 hours a week in North Carolina. And um, I, I'm, I'm pretty competitive, and every week they had a contest. And th this particular week, if you had your very best week, they would send your mom a dozen roses. I was focused. <laughs> Monday through Friday, I had a really good week. And on Friday night, all I had to do was sell seven more customers in, the, in that day from 8 in the morning to 9.30 at night. And my mama would have a dozen roses. Was I motivated? Yeah, because vision, that vision helped me, helped, helped me be focused, but helped fuel me. I got up in the morning. And I mean to tell you, I was just like running between doors. If I sensed someone wasn't interested, I'd say, excuse me, you're not interested in buying these books. So I, okay, cool, thanks. <laughs> I sold my seventh customer by 12.30 that afternoon. I'm like, yeah. See, when you have a strong, strong why, it, it fuels energy. A compelling vision for the future not only keeps you focused, but it fuels you as well. Think about the Apostle Paul. Here's how the Apostle Paul describes part of his ministry, and he sang, sang it in the first song. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not, but not destroyed. Hey, how do you keep going on in a ministry like that? It's hard. I've been in contexts like that. I've had ministry seasons like that, but not the whole show. Here's what keeps him going, I think. He writes these words. Uh, right after he just wrote what I just read. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, light and momentary, persecuted, hard-pressed, perplexed, struck down, uh, and he didn't even put in having rocks thrown at him. That's light and momentary. Here's why it's light and momentary. It's light and momentary are cheering for us and uh, because of the eternal glory that far away is this. I got to read here. Eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. But what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Is eternal. What, what kept him going? Vision. It gave him focus, but but gave him fuel, vision, vision, vision. And so where are we in all of this? Um, we're in a process, of, as I told you uh, in the beginning of the sermon series. There's a renewal team, seven of us, that meet uh, once a month to think through these things. And... Uh, the process is not us getting together and telling you what we're doing. Uh, we, we've, we've met a bunch, we're working on some things, and we'd like to uh, invite you as a congregation to a meeting to discuss some of these things. Uh, we're gonna have some ideas up on the board, we'll break into small groups, we'll get some input, we'll pray together. Uh, and that's gonna take place, uh, skip a bunch of slides here, uh, congregational meeting or gathering will be April 30th, 11.30 to 1. You'll hear more about this later, but just kind of, if you can get it on your calendar, uh, that would be uh, that would be great. A couple questions for you uh, that I'd like to dialogue with uh, some other people. With what from this sermon did you especially connect? What do you have questions about? Talk to someone else. What, what in the sermon uh, uh, piqued your interest? What do you think, number two, what do you think Trinity's vision should be? Vision is about why we exist. And number three, how might this sermon be applied to you in your life? Example, your family, your retirement, your health, your faith. Do you have a vision for your life? Do you have a vision for the rest of your life? As God said to Ezekiel, I believe God says to us, come alive. Come alive. As God said to Ezekiel, I will make breath enter you and you will come alive. I think God's saying that to us. Be a church of growth. 
where, where you love others. Come alive. Be a church of witness. Be a church of grace that thinks of the interests of others. Come alive, the Spirit of God is saying that. Be a church where everyone discovers and uses their gifts to serve. Be a church that gathers to worship in spirit and in truth. Come alive. Come alive in your marriage. Come alive in your work. Come alive, Trinity Church. Come alive. Be a church of groups where you can know others and be known. Be a church that knows your vision, values, and strategy and come alive. Come alive, come alive, dry bones. Come alive, Trinity. Come, come alive. For we hunger for
Get up, you dry bones. There's a new day.